these three EQ mistakes that I'm about to show you in this video are potentially ruining your mixes. These are not only beginner mistakes, I see them happening all the time even with more experienced electronic music producers. And worst of all, there are tons of BS YouTube tutorials that spread this flawed advice over and over again, and that just adds to the confusion and ruins people's mixes. So my goal with this video is to tell you the truth about some of these EQ techniques and help you avoid the most common mistakes. Let's jump in. My name is Philip from Pick Yourself and the reason I can make these bold claims in the intro is because I do mixing and mastering full time for a living in my Berlin based studio. I specialize in electronic music genres like techno, house, EDM and honestly I get hundreds of productions to listen to every single year and I see these mistakes happening again and again. Now, if you want to make serious progress as a music producer, then I have something for you. It's a free gift called the Finisher Framework. It's my three simple steps to finishing at least one great sounding song per month. This is a totally doable goal, but you have to implement the right systems to do so. You can get it at pickyourself.com framework. The link is also in the description. Make sure to check this out. It's really going to change the game for you. All right, let's get to our three EQ mistakes that I wanna talk about and make sure to stick around for the last one. This is an especially dangerous and tricky one that even the more experienced producers overlook. The first EQ mistake that I wanna talk about has to do with resonances. Now, there are actually two different problems with this. People either don't care about resonances in the sound at all or don't really know how to deal with it. And the second thing is even more dangerous, which is over removing resonances. And I'm going to show you what I mean with this. So I've got this little loop here and I want you to listen to this and especially pay attention to what the symbol is doing. So overall, this is a great sounding sample. I really like the symbol, but over time it gets pretty annoying because of one really strong resonance. And that is something that is part of the cymbal sound, so this is completely normal here. But since it's a sample and not like a real drum kit where someone's hitting, every single hit has exactly the same resonance happening all the time. Now let's take a look and see what we can do here. Let's listen to this again and take a look at what we see on the spectrum analyzer. So most of the resonant frequencies are happening around here. Now I will show you how I would solve this typically and I will also show you the mistake that a lot of producers, even experienced ones, are doing. So what I like about the FabFilter Pro Q3 and also other EQs like the Kirchhoff EQ, those type of modern visual EQs, they allow you to typically grab a resonance right from the frequency spectrum and just pull it down. This is a really handy way of dealing with resonances and let's take a look at how this is solved here. Now already I hope you can tell that this sounds much cleaner because this main resonance is removed. But here's also the first mistake. Most producers just randomly pull down whatever resonance sticks out the most and it might not be the best one. Let's now remove the other resonances here and see what we end up with. Now, as you can tell, this sounds, again, much cleaner, but here is the mistake within the mistake, number one. <laughs> and that is, if you remove too many resonances of a sound, then you're taking away all of the character because resonances, in essence, are just overtones, in most cases, that stand in musical relation to whatever the fundamental note is of that instrument. So let's imagine you have something as complex as a cymbal or as a guitar or a rich sounding synth. If you just remove all of the resonances, then it just sounds lifeless, boring, muddy, 
and doesn't have any character anymore. And this is exactly what happens here. If I pull away all these individual resonances, it just sounds quite dull and boring. So what you have to do, the right way to approach the resonance thing is to properly test the resonances against each other and really end up with a nice balance where you remove the annoying parts and keep the characterful ones or a combination of individual resonances, but maybe not taken out completely. Let me show you. So this to me is a really nice compromise with less resonances, less annoying resonances, but still something that makes it a bit more clean, a bit more punchy and overall will work better in the mix. If you got any value out of this video so far, consider hitting the like button, subscribe to the channel. It would mean the world to me. It helps me know that I'm on the right track with this type of content and it helps me stay motivated for publishing videos every single week. I take this time out of my busy day in the studio. I could also just continue working with clients or coaching people. But I do this because it gives me a lot of joy and I really like helping people. Let's move to mistake number two and this is such a critical one. Honestly, I can't stand it anymore. So many tutorials out there are preaching that you should low cut and high cut everything, whatever the reason might be. Yeah, some channel recommend that you do this because it increases your headroom. Some channels do this because it's supposed to make your tracks sound cleaner. From a professional mixing and mastering engineer standpoint, it's an absolute nightmare to do this because you're, first of all, you need more processing power. Secondly, it just increases distortion. It changes the phase response. So all of this is possible just by doing this for no good reason. Uh, so my recommendation for you is to only low cut or high cut when it's absolutely necessary. This is the minimum viable EQ approach that I find very effective. Let's take a look at the kick drum, for example. I will solo this. We're going to listen to the kick drum and see what the spectrum analyzer is telling us. So I'm really happy with the sound of the kick, but what a lot of people would do just because they are supposed to do this according to some YouTube tutorials, they're just going to filter out some of the low end here and also some of the high end. Just low cut and high cut everything and this is what you end up with. And I'm not even being super aggressive with it. Now this doesn't look like a lot, but honestly this is a dramatic change of the character of this kick drum and it's not changed in a good way. I feel that the low end energy is missing completely now, even if it's just a couple of dBs that it gets reduced. And also on the high end, I mean, you could argue that you don't want as much of the click sound and therefore you want to cut it. But I see a lot of producers then later on in the mixing stage, when the production is there with all the elements, they feel like their kick drum is not cutting through and then they use whatever fancy analog plug-in emulation and boost the exact frequency that they just cut out before. And this does not make any sense at all. It's unnecessary processing. So let's get rid of that again. Now, let me show you an example where you actually need to do a low cut. And this is once again, the symbol. Listen to the symbol and look at what this is doing in the low end. Why the hell does a symbol sample have something going on between 20 and zero Hertz? This does not make any sense at all. And even like above that, around 50 Hertz, we also had some acoustic energy. In most cases, you will just not hear this at all. Even if you cut it out and bypass it, you're just not gonna hear any change or hearing only gets down to 20 Hertz. But this is still taking away from our technical headroom in the session. So in this case, it makes absolute sense to do a low cut. So this just gave us a little bit more headroom and it does not change the sound in any negative way. Let's now talk about the third and most problematic EQ mistake that I see people make, beginners and well-established producers alike. And that is you use fancy EQ features even if they're not necessary. And I'm talking about mid-side processing especially, dynamic EQ, linear phase mode, all these things 
are super specialized functions for specific use cases to solve a specific problem and not your default solution for everything. Let me show you why. Let's take a look at our base now. I'm going to solo this, you're going to listen to this and we'll see what happens. Now, this is a good example of what happens when you overdo fancy EQ techniques. So for example, we have linear phase mode on, we have uh, very steep filters, we have dynamic EQ happening here, mid side EQ, and all of that because it is possible we're supposed to do it. And we see some fancy tutorials out there that show us advanced MS and dynamic EQing techniques. So we think we need to do this as well in our productions every single time. This is really bad advice and I'm going to explain why. So the problem here is that you don't know what you don't know. Most producers have blind spots when it comes to the actual consequences and side effects of these types of processing. You pay a price for every new feature that you use. Linear phase mode, for example, an EQ that uses linear phase mode introduces an artifact that's called pre-ringing, especially in the base area. So if you do something like this, a really steep cut, and you do it in linear phase mode, then chances are that you are introducing some pre-ringing. Now I can't go into all the physical details of this, there's enough information online on researching this, but I just want you to be aware, there is always a consequence sonically to choosing these types of settings. In some cases, it makes total sense to use a linear phase EQ. For example, if you have two different base layers and you want to make sure that everything stays in phase, because every EQ change typically changes the phase response as well, linear phase mode minimizes this as much as possible. In these cases, it might make sense to use linear phase EQ, but in many other cases, it just does not make any sense. So here, for example, it's absolutely not necessary. Then. Dynamic EQ, let's talk about this quickly. Dynamic EQ means that you are changing the frequency response dynamically at a specific point, at a specific range. Now, this is a reactive way of EQing, meaning the changes only happen when this dynamic EQ is being triggered in a certain way. For example, if a certain threshold is met. What does dynamic processing always do? Well, it changes the groove of the signal. So every time you introduce dynamic processing, you are messing with the groove of the signal. Something like this bass signal actually should be quite stable if possible in electronic music. I don't want any huge changes in the low end happening from one note to the other notes. But still, a lot of producers are doing exactly that thing using dynamics processing. In this example, definitely counterproductive. I would absolutely deactivate this. And the same holds true with mid-side processing you always pay a price here. If you rip apart the mid signal from the side signal, it's easy to overdo this and the signal at some point just feels a little bit artificial and not, not in a good way. If you do this on many channels, this ends up messing with your overall phase response of the entire piece. Yeah? And sometimes I get sent these tracks for mastering where everything just feels off in terms of the phase correlation. People have mostly overdone MS processing because they did not know what they are doing. So let's listen to this and first of all just bypass it and see if that even sounds better. So on good headphones, even if I have not overdone these settings, I can already tell that the signal sounds much more coherent even without any processing. This is definitely done in a bad way here. Now what I would probably do, let's just remove everything, go back to normal and see what I would actually do with this. Let's listen to this. So what I like a lot is actually the natural phase mode. This is kind of a compromise between linear phase and zero latency. This is kind of my default state that I'm using. When I now listen to this, I mean we have this delay going on with the bass. It could sometimes be a good idea to remove, for example, the side signal in the very low end to make sure that it's not messing phase-wise. Um, in this case, it is not 100% necessary because the delay is quite yeah, quiet, but it would be a good use case. So let's low cut this and use only the side signal to cut this out. So 
So this would be a good example of a use case where MS processing actually makes sense. And then you can maybe boost the top end a little bit to make sure that those side shots are popping out a little bit there. And then you can theoretically combine this with a little bit of a mid boost, for example, where it's actually necessary, which is like the center frequency of this specific base. So there's no cut necessary here. This would be a much healthier signal. Let's listen to this. So what I did here is I kept the integrity of the signal true. This just still sounds really coherent but just a little bit better. Yeah, this is what I want to do with EQing. The thing that I want you to pay attention to is when you see any advice out there, always try to ask yourself, okay, what is the potential downside? And try to research if you can find any downside. Everyone who sells you advice that this is the only way to do X, Y, Z, it's probably not true. Do some research and also ask the right questions. Always be critical with any advice, also with the advice that I'm giving, of course. And I would like to hear from you in the comments if you got anything out of this and if you have any follow-up questions. So that is it, thanks for watching. And if you currently don't finish at least one great sounding song per month, and you also release it, then I highly recommend you get the finisher framework. Just go to pickyourself.com slash framework and I will see you on the other side. Thank you.